Hello my brothers and sisters of the Order, welcome back to the Order, I'm Celtic Templar, and for this video, yes, we are talking about Celtic Warfare. Now, let's actually get to a backdrop in history, and what we have to understand. Now, for one, I have to put this out here, the Celts, as we understand, Celtic Warfare is different compared to what group, in fact. Our major understanding of Celtic style warfare is somewhat different compared to what we understand. Now. We have to actually put this down into many categories, such as during the Bronze Age, such as during the period in, well, the Celts of Gaul, the Celts of Iberia, and the Britannic Celts. However, the Celtic people throughout other parts of Europe have somewhat of a different type of terming, and as which even the Celts of Germania, or in this case, uh, the Rhine River, were actually stated to be nearly acting identical to that of the Celts of Gaul. So, yeah. So, now, I hear many of you already, uh, but Templar, what exactly did the Celtic Warfare exactly look like? Did it look something like this or that? Well, uh, first we had to understand that the Celts, we had uh, many parts over, many people actually stated that the Celts fought naked, or that they all wore blue war paint. No, that is actually a myth. Uh, one major form to this is that it was technically written down by the Romans of, and Greeks, who of which the Celts would have fought against. And here's the major thing, there's a difference between the Continental Celts and the Britannic Celts, or the Celts of Britannia, and the Celts of the rest of Europe. Who of which, by this point in time, especially when the Romans first faced off against the Celts during the sacking of Rome, it's pretty much stated that at this, this point in time, that the Celts, well, they, uh, as I stated, were a lot different. And that's the major point. And by this point in time, especially when the Romans were have their own city sacked, it's stated that the Celtic armies would have actually discarded the idea of blue war paint. This would have been mostly during the time of the Bronze Age. However, during the Bronze Age collapse, there is a huge... Uh, psychological background to it, so yeah, it's kind of confusing. But maybe we should actually talk about what did the Continental Celts and the Britannic Celts actually look like during the, well, Bronze Age, shall we? Alright, now as we can understand, the Bronze Age period is a period in timeline of which we had to understand of warfare and tactics. So, how did the Celts uh, make, well, type of warfare? What was their idealism of warfare, comparing that to other cultures? Well, one major thing is during the time of the Bronze Age period, especially, the Celts did use uh, blue war paint, or in this case, tattoos. Yes, the Celts were originally uh, covered with blue tattoos all over the bodies. However, uh, over time, especially when the Romans had started to conquer the region of Gaul, or especially during the time when the Romans had their homeland sacked, it's actually stated that the Continental Celts were no longer have the blue tattoos. They now were more, uh, well, different. But that's different compared to Britannia, but we'll get to them very soon. So, what did Bronze Age warfare for the Celts look like? Well, that is actually kind of a hard one to explain. During the early periods, Celtic warriors were actually stated to be tattooed during the Bronze Age. However, it is stated that when they fought, they actually were stated to have worn no armor, and also just merely pants, or including that of armor, that of which would probably be of gambesons. Like, see this image here? This actually does give a good explanation of what the Celtic uh, everyday warrior would have looked like. They would have looked as though they had... Uh, well, uh, well, type of, I want to say, sleeveless gambeson, I guess is the correct term I can come up with. And even though this sounds weirdly idiotic and stupid and it doesn't sound like it works, it actually has been proven that the Celts might have done this with a type of mixture of, well, a thin layer of cotton wool, meaning it would be a sheet of buckskin, or in this case of rawhide or leather that would have been boiled on the outside, then the interior would be made out of wool or cotton mix, and then another layer would also be that 
of boiled leather. And in doing so, it makes a very sturdy armor to stop, well, Bronze Age weaponry. However, even during the time of the Iron Age, Celtic warriors would have somewhat actually used this, which there is a huge difference to this. But it's actually stated that champion warriors would have probably fought uh, bare-chested. But if before you start saying that they uh, fought naked, no, that is actually very incorrect. In fact, no warrior in history would ever show off their uh, <clears throat> uh, parts to their opponent for them to stab. Now, it is stated, though, that many Celtic warriors had actually dressed in this type of armor and system, and as well did wear said iconical helmets, that of which were mostly made out of bronze. However, the Hallstatt culture, which had was, was stated to be the golden age of the bronze Celtic people, even it had, well, bronze design armor. However, mostly meant for decorational use or ceremonial use, we don't know. However, it was hardly ever seen in the warfare zone. However, most Celtic warriors actually did fight, as I stated, with a type of, like, well, sleeveless armor, making it well, perfect for their arms to be used to set cutting and thrusting blows, especially with a type of shield formation, that of which the Romans would actually later on call a uh, type of phalanx. And this phalanx was actually held together by the chieftain, who of which was in the center ranks. He would have directed his army. This is technically how the Celts would have actually done it. It would somewhat look near identical to that of a shield wall, as we know, a shield wall formation, it overlaps to a type of point and layer and layer. However, Celtic shield walls were slightly different. Instead of them just going the entire same direction, the Celtic shield wall had a type of interior direction, meaning the interior type of way, meaning that they were all, well, held together at the center. This meant that it was an impressive design that which the Celts were using to, in order to, well, push through an enemy type position. Which, this is kind of impressive because imagine, say, my hands being the Celtic shield wall. As soon as they would charge, it turns into a boar head spear. Which, if none of you understand, the boar head is one of the most devastating things one could actually do in the shield wall formation to punch through an enemy shield wall, which the Celts were known for. Now, Bronze Age warfare was a lot different for the Celts, especially, and it changed over time, especially when we take a look at different periods and cultures. Now, one major thing I have to put out here, the Celts uh, had a different form in fighting during the Bronze Age. However, the Bronze Age culture did have chariot warfare, and the fact the Celts of the Bronze Age were stated to have used the chariots as a type of mobile type military, meaning uh, an armored personnel carrier, if you would, like we do with modern military. In fact, a Celtic warrior was said to be dropped off at the middle or at the very uh, very ranks of the said attacking force, and in doing so, the chariot would then spin around, coming then back for that said champion when he was technically done killing. Now, in doing so, they stated that they would throw javelins from the said chariot and then run off. But that's a different story altogether. But pretty much we can understand why the Celts actually did this type of form in history, because this is the Bronze Age period, prior before the Bronze Age collapse. Now, many historians are still wondering, maybe that the Celtic warriors that would have done this, did this in order to protectively use as a barrier to stop a certain uh, weaponry. Now, we don't know if that's true or not, but if you imagine it, just imagine a type of circular type system moving around your phalanx up into an enemy type, well, phalanx as well, clashing together and it would technically uh, be used that way. However, it's even stated that sometimes the chariots would have wrapped around the enemy dropping off their champions and slaughtering up their opponents in a type of guerrilla combat system or a, uh, well, type of system of warfare that would surround and slaughter your opponents. Which, if you think about it, that actually makes a little more sense. Alright, now let's go into the Celts of Gaul. Now, the Celts of Gaul were a lot different compared that to the historical forms in history. Why? Well, 
the Celtic Gauls actually fought in a different type of uh, system. One is by the time of the Iron Age period, especially, uh, which and now you don't understand, the Romans called any Celt on the continent a Gaul, but in their language, in the Celtic language, they called themselves Celts, but in the Romans tongue, they called them Gauls. So, yeah. Now, even the Metatron has actually explained this, and he actually is a really, uh, gives a good explanation of Celtic warfare, even though he's a Roman, so, yeah. But, anyways. Now, we have to understand that the Celtic warfare in general is a lot different in Gaul during the Iron Age period than it is in other periods. One is the, the fact that we can take a look at the Latin culture. The Latin culture is a treasure trove of, well, Celtic artifacts. And as well, this is actually one of the most beautiful things out there because, in fact, there are more than dozens of Celtic swords. Yes, I mean it. This is actually kind of hilarious that most people don't understand, is that the Celtic sword, or the Celtic longsword of the Gauls, would have been elongated for a purpose reason. One is not just for infantry to use, but also cavalry. Because of the fact, the chariot had been, well, uh, gotten rid of in history, and in fact, well, guess what? The Celts of the continent were now using cavalry rather than chariot warfare which gives us a good explanation of how they would have fought. Now, it is stated, though, when fighting in this form, the Cal Celtic cavalry would have actually uh, used javelins and including that of spearhead design thrusts in the side uh, exposed ranks of the enemy's attacking force. As well, they would even use swords, just to be safe. Now, let's first talk about their cavalry, shall we? What is pretty much the most major difference to it? Well, that's the major point. The horse was, as I stated, no longer attached to the chariot. Now it was just a, well, a one-person, one-on-horse type deal. And the fact, as I stated, the Celts would have used chariots as a type of, well, uh, armored personnel carrier. But now there was just a one-man killing machine just throwing javelins at his opponent's sides which is a good explanation to it. But however, the Celtic longsword is one of the major things that we have to understand. Because the fact that Celtic warriors, especially that of cavalry, who could actually afford a horse in armor at the time, could easily get the said type of horse. Now, here's what I have to explain to y'all. Celtic style cavalry, now you have to be rich enough to actually afford one, and in doing so, you have to also be rich enough to actually afford the said equipment and all that. So, in truth, the cavalry was a rich man's type of warfare, comparing that to the rest of the Celtic army, that of which in Gaul were mostly just of, well, regular soldiers. They wouldn't have fought like uh, that of the said other Celtic warriors. In doing so, the Celtic imagery of Gaul were somewhat different. One way in truth we can actually see this is how the Celtic warfare and cavalry had changed and evolved. In fact, Celtic cavaliers were actually stated to have worn, well, if they could afford it, a helmet and mail armor as armor. Now, even though if sometimes though they would also wear sleeveless design armor. Now, the major type of helmet they would have actually used would actually have to be none other than this helmet here. The Gallic style helm, which the Romans later on copied and used for their own army. Now, uh, the Celts of Gaul would have used this design, and especially, as well so with the infantry. However, infantry would most likely use uh, the other design like this, that of which they might have taken from Romans or used it themselves and manufactured it in historical purposes. But as I stated, mail is one of the biggest type of categories of armor, that of which was, well, uh, expensive. So, what would be the everyday Celtic warrior's armor? Well, that would mostly time be, as I stated with the earlier Celtic Bronze Age period, it would mostly be like a sleepless style armor. Kind of like a gambeson, or that of, as I stated, a mixture of a jerkin mixed in with, uh, well, uh, cotton and 
well, wool. And in doing so, it would make sense to actually provide this perfect armor from the said weapon. However, even during this point in time, the Celtic sword during the time in Gaul, here's the major thing. There were cheap knockoff variations, which were of a cheaper quality of iron, which mostly a lot of, well, uh, common Celtic people could have owned. And this type of sword would be known as steely iron to many uh, blacksmiths. In other words, it can bend, it can warp. So, it's not exactly a Celtic chieftain sword, which there's a huge difference between the Celtic chieftain swords and a Celtic commoner sword, or a common Celtic sword, which are huge difference. One major variation, as I said, is that steely iron. It will bend, it will warp, which there are many accounts from Romans saying that the Celtic warriors had to put their foot down on the said weapon to bend it back into place in order to use it, which in truth has uh, somewhat actually been heard in history of this happening in battle uh, also in the Bronze Age period not just with the Celts but also with the Greeks and so on so that gives us a good explanation now uh, we have to understand though that the Celtic warfare in general in Gaul was entirely different due to the fact that they how they used it especially also the Celtic warheads on their said arrows or spears which would look somewhat like this brutal bastard, which would be known to sever arteries. And in doing so, that wavelength type design was meant to cut limbs, especially. And it's actually stated that the Celts of Germania used a spear somewhat like this near the Rhine River. But they used it as a two meter long sword, almost like a cutting type weapon. And instead of doing thrusts, stab, 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 they also did cutting motion at a said exposed limbs, exposed feet especially, such as the exposed region of the Achilles tendon, to cut and sever it especially. In other words, come around the said leg and sweep under and probably cause him to bleed to death. So, that can explain a lot. So if Celts of Gaul would have fought like this, this would explain a lot of how the Romans feared the Celts so much. However, the Celts of Gaul would have also used the chieftain sword, which would have at the time been used by Celtic chieftains. As well, the Celtic chieftains would have also used mail, as I stated. But that's my major point. However, the Celtic chieftain sword would be a beautiful sword that which would have different materials of handle grips, sometimes made out of beautiful silver, rubies, and such and such to make a beautiful jeweled sword, especially also with a scabbard, and including that also maybe a bronze style head. However, they would always have the same design grip, that type of human, well, looking handle, which in truth is probably the most horrifying thing you could ever face on the battlefield. Alright, now let's talk about the Celt Iberians. Now, who were the Celt Iberians and how did their warfare fight? Well, before you all start understanding the fact that the Celt Iberians were, well, from Iberia, well, in truth, the Celt Iberians were not exactly what we might call uh, normal Celts. Now, before you start saying, what do you mean by that? Nah. In truth, they kind of were, well, more different. More uh, constitutional to their ideals and is which were somewhat near identical to that of other Celtic tribes other than Gaul and Britannia. It's actually stated that the Celt Iberians would have actually used shorter style weapons and as well were the perfect mercenary units for most of the said Mediterranean, but I think I will get to that very soon. Now, one major way we can understand the history of the Celt Iberians is actually during the time of the Punic Wars, or even after the Punic Wars, especially when Hannibal Barca came to power. Now, when we know one thing about the uh, wars with Rome and Carthage, it's actually stated that the Celt Iberians would have used several design weapons. One in particular would be the Falcata, which is a technically known as the poor man's sword, for, well, the poorer soldier, kind of like the steely iron sword for the Celts of Gaul. It would be a common sword out there, not like it would, she will, would be used by common warriors. 
Now it's actually stated that it would have a blunt side on the back for a purpose and reason. It'd be kind of like of how we view the sax or well any weapon that which would have a back non back edge. In other words, there would be a single edge blade for a reason. This was manufactured in order to make it incredibly resistant and strong enough to have enough strength to not bend, which was meant why it was meant to be created that way. So the Celts Iberians created this type of falcata, of which would later on be copied by more than one culture in particular, especially the fact that the falcata sword was actually used by the Greeks and Macedonians, or the Greek Empire used by Alexander the Great. However, that was later on known as the Copis, but there's a difference between the two, but there actually isn't. Uh, however, the Celt Iberians actually used two design falcata swords. One meant for infantry, and one meant for cavalry. What is the difference? Well, one would be the length, and two would be the design of the forward curve. For example, the cavalry Iberians would have actually used a forward design curve and which would be elongated enough for a good hit. And in doing so, this type of, in which it would be about yay big of a blade length, so that's still big enough, it would have a forward curve. The reason for this is because it has more power in a said hit. It would feel like an axe to your opponent. So, in other words, it looks like a sword, it weighs like a sword, but when your opponent gets hit by it, it's like an axe. It's a brutal weapon that cleaves into the human body, which that is probably the most horrifying part about it. But the infantry, however, would have used a straighter design version, and of which was slightly shorter, and in fact would probably be the same design uh, blade length as a gladius. However, it would still have an enough, uh, an enough power, that enough kick to it, that of which would bite into a shield that would cleave into a helmet or worse into your arm especially even if you were in gambeson armor so that's how dangerous these weapons were as well another beautiful part about it is that curvature umbrella handle now why is this kind of obvious if this sword was said to have gotten stuck in a shield they could easily just pull it out and it could easily be still being used which that is the horrifying part about why the Celtiberians were so fierce on the battlefield Another weapon in history that would have been used by the Celt Iberians, especially the richer Celt Iberians, would be the Gladius. That's right, the Gladius Hespaniensis, the Sword of Spain, which the Romans copied and used for their military. So that's kind of hilarious. Now, the original Celt Iberian sword would mostly have a leaf shaped blade design, that would have been made out of iron. Now these were technically stated to have been Celtic style Cheetan swords in Iberia. So why did the Celt Iberians create shorter swords? This is kind of a big story question. Many historians state it might be because of the fact that there wasn't that much iron to make the said weapons, or they were improving their weapons in order to defeat armor of the era. Which that is actually my best thought to it, because it makes sense. You want to have a weapon to defeat a said armor in order to win a battle. In fact, the Gladius sword of the Gladius Hispaniensis was meant for both thrusting and cutting design blows, which that was actually the perfect part about the leaf-shaped blade. It would leave a big wound, comparing that to the Gladius somewhat. But uh, many historians don't understand, though, is the armor that the Celt Iberians would have used would have been male. Yes, male armor was the invention of the Celt Iberians, in which when they created it, it said that it was all throughout most parts of Iberia, comparing that to the rest of Europe. So in doing so, the Romans copied mail from the Celts as well, so that it can explain a lot. But you can understand that the Celt Iberians would have created the mail in such a design form that it was near impossible to uh, duplicate. In other words, the Romans actually stated that the design system of this armor was different compared to how they would make it. So, the Romans later on knew that they had to capture some Celtic blacksmiths or higher blacksmiths from the Celtic regions in order to, well, uh, make better armor. In fact, they just see that there was a huge difference between Celtic style mail and Roman style mail during the early periods of the Roman Republic. 
So we can understand of how that could actually make sense until its later periods. But in truth, Celtic male armor was manufactured in a type of way to be sleeveless and also have a doublet. This would actually double in the design for the said shoulders, which uh, that actually makes sense for one major reason. One, you don't want to lose your arms, especially in the said shoulder region. As well, you want to have your arms free enough to be more light and, well, less cumbersome. So you can easily use your weapon. So that makes sense why the Celts would have, I, of Iberia would have actually used this. Now, one major way we can understand and under which uh, duplicate this is to the fact that this is, can easily be explained to how the Romans later on copied the Gladius. So why? Well, kind of obvious. The Falcata was meant to destroy the male underneath, well, technically destroy the body underneath the male armor, but the Gladius was meant to puncture through it. So there's a huge difference between the two. So, yeah. But now, another weapon the Celtiberians would have also used would be the Soliferum, or in this case, the early Roman javelin before Rome copied it. So, it's kind of hilarious of how the Romans did this. So, what would be the huge difference in the style of warfare with the Celt Iberians with this javelin? Well, in truth, it's actually stated that the Celt Iberians would have used the javelin as a, well, a skirmishing type weapon to attack the flanks of their opponent. Meaning, just because you see a Roman army marching through a said area doesn't mean you're going to not want to go around them and attack them. Which, this is what the major thing that the Celtiberians did with their cavalry. First, they threw the Soliferum Javelin at the flanks, then they came at them with their, their well, Falcata cavalry swords. So, that can explain a lot. But now, what exactly was their military formation? Well, as I stated, these guys would have mostly been donned in a type of armor of mail. However, their main swords would always be the Falcata unless you were a nobleman or could afford a said, well, Gladius. Now, some Celtic Iberians would have also used some plate armor different to what we might understand. It would technically look like that of what we would view a, uh, or as well with the said Roman uh, principes or something or lower before them, who of which would have actually sometimes worn a type of breastplate or a type of loose plate armor, that of which would have held out against said uh, blows to the front. However, this is actually how the Celtiberians would have fought. And as well, they would have also used a type of ovalish style shield in a type of formation. However, Celtiberian style military formation was slightly different comparing that to the Celts of Gaul. Yes, they would have still used cavalry, however, this design system of warfare was slightly different. One is the major form that there would have actually been still the phalanx style position formation of warfare. Then there would also be a said uh, skirmishing unit. Now, skirmishers were known to have used buckler shields, the soliferum javelins, and falcata swords, and did not wear any armor. This would make them light, uh, well, free folk military, as they were known by the said Celts. These type of soldiers were incredibly dangerous on the battlefield, especially from throwing a spear at their opponent and darting and retreating backwards into the said, well, areas. This would attack the flanks of the said division, especially that of Romans. And then comes the cavalry, who would attack along the sides and then attack the rear which would be a devastating blow to an opponent's army. It's actually stated that Hannibal Barca might have actually copied this ideal design of warfare from the Celt Iberians due to the fact that by the point his, uh, during the time of the time he fought in the Punic Wars, Carthage had actually, well, conquered pretty much most of Celt Iberia, so that can explain a lot. So, we can understand of how the Celt Iberians would have fought because of that. So. We can understand, this is really impressive to historical standards on how impressive this style of warfare was. Now, in doing so, it is slightly different compared to that of other Celtic people. Alright, now comes the Celts of Britannia. 
Now, how did the Celts of Britannia fight? This is a major one that we have to put out here. Now, let's first talk about their armor. What did they wear? Well, not exactly much. In fact, this is actually what uh, many historians actually still agree with, due to the fact of them being isolated from the rest of the continent, which, if none of you understand, the Celtic Britannia people, they did not evolve their armor system as much due to the fact they were isolated for so long from other cultures. And that, In fact, this can easily be seen in history if, for example, if, well, we were technically to be isolated from a said civilization for so long, guess what? Uh, a Neolithic people can easily stay in the Neolithic form for so long. This could easily be seen with Japan, for example, um, some say also with the Philippines, and even with the Americas itself, who, which uh, did not actually, um, were isolated from Europe and such, and the rest of, said, well, other cultures from the rest of around the world, and in doing so, they kind of didn't, uh, well, evolve their style of military until it was a little too late, and even then, it was still too late. So, you see my point. However, that's the way the Celts were. The Celts were of Britannia, well, they used different style of armor and equipment, and of which was mostly that of the Bronze Age period. However, they did use Iron Age swords, some of them did, especially that of chieftains, such as one of the most famous would be Casavalanus, who defeated Julius Caesar. He was stated to have had a beautiful design sword, that and which would have been have elongated blade, and in such, uh, well, would mostly look as though it had been blessed by the gods themselves. So that can explain a lot on what the sword might have looked like. Now, though, one major detail in history, and I understand, that the Celts of Britannia were majorly uh, an export of tin, which that gives us a major form. It, if I'm trying to understand, Bronze is actually made of tin and copper. So, we have to understand that tin is a major rare resource that the Romans needed, and guess what? Britannia had a lot of it. So, that makes a major point. There's actually also been documentation in history of the Celts actually having copper shipped over and creating... So, this might explain on what the type of weapons and armor they could have used. They might have been able to manufacture bronze style swords, which, now you understand, look like a leaf-shaped blade, perfect for cutting and thrusting. However, they could have also used javelins, and as well, a type of warfare system a lot different compared to the rest of the culture. In other words, these guys were mostly of a guerrilla style warfare, not like the rest of the said uh, continental Celts. Due to the fact that continental Celts when it came to their style of warfare, they had to fight against other Celtic tribes, yes, just like the Britannians. However, they also had to fight against the Romans, and as well the Carthaginians, and even the Greeks, who of which had different design styles of warfare compared to that of the Celts. So, the Celts of Britannia used a type of skirmishing style of guerrilla warfare with chariots. Yes, they were still using chariot warfare, rather than fighting well, with cavalry, and this can easily be explained in history. However, another detail can also be to the fact that the Celts of Britannia were still wearing tattoos, meaning they were still have the bluish style type tattoos all over their bodies, comparing that to the rest of the Celtic world. So, just because they were isolated for so long, this can explain the fact that the Celts weren't able to evolve their army, or, uh, and such, like the rest of the Kel said Celts of Britannia, or, uh, well, the continents. Now, many of you might wonder, if Britannia could was so, uh, well, isolated, then how did they ever know about, well, what was going to happen? Well, that's the thing. They know that the Romans were going to invade, it happened more than once. And the fact is, the Celts of Britannia have actually fought against each other for so long, that it's technically been an enclaving of war and so on. However, even when the Romans invaded the said re, uh, island of Britannia, they had faced such a resistance it was near impossible to face off a type of one-on-one -on -one fighting in the form of guerrilla warfare. 
which that is how the Celts of Britannia had de defeated army after army that later on invaded their country. So that could explain a lot. That could also explain on how maybe uh, the Saxons could have actually won, especially against the Normans, or as well the uh, as well, even if Germany had actually managed to land into Britain, they could have easily just used guerrilla style warfare in order to win. So there's a huge difference to that. But see, geography explains a lot. In doing so, the Celts of Britannia believed we don't need to improve our army. We just need to actually adapt to our landscape and know it best to defeat our enemies. Which, that can explain a lot in history. Which, yes, Celtic warfare in general, in the style of Britannia, was incredibly of guerrilla-style combat, that of which Rome was not used to at all. They were used to marching in, uh, well, a single-file military line in history. They were never exactly used to marching and then getting slaughtered. In fact, this could easily be seen uh, at the Battle of Teutoburg Forest, for example, of which led to a massacre of two to three legions. So, yeah, that is not the best point in history for Rome. However, it actually can easily be explained on how the Celts of Britannia lost their war to Rome entirely because of the fact that the Celts were kind of betrayed by because, well, the Romans made allies with other Celtic tribes. In order to win. So, yeah. But if Celtic warfare was still of the Bronze Age period in Britannia, what about the Picts? What about the Irish? Well, they did use, well, still the old Bronze Age design style of warfare. However, the further north you went, the more and more the sword would look like a spear because of the fact that there was a less variety of tin or in such of iron, and in doing so, well, guess what, they're not going to have that type of said armor. And even male armor was somewhat very, even more rare, the further north you went. So, yeah. So the further north, it would be extremely hard to find male armor, so that can explain a lot. However, we can understand the fact that the Celtic warfare for the Celts in Britannia was incredibly, well, different, and yet more brutal, due to the fact that it was one-on-one -on -one fighting in a type of form of Bronze Age style warfare, that of which Rome was not exactly used to. So, even though this might have been outdated type of fighting, Rome was not used to fighting like this. So that can explain a lot in, this, in a short while. Alright, now let's go into Celtic people as mercenaries. Now, Celtic mercenaries is a massive plural term. Now, where did the Celtic mercenaries come from, and who were they fighting for? Well, this can easily be explained in many forms, especially to the fact that the earliest Celtic warfare, especially for mercenaries, was first seen during the Bronze Age and into the Iron Age, especially when the time when Rome came. Now, it is stated that the Celtic mercenaries would have been from Iberia, Gaul, and Britannia sometimes. However, it's actually stated that the Celts of Britannia would have actually stayed isolated for so long and not been mercenaries at all. However, the Celts of Gaul were perfect as a type of cavalry style armies. These guys would have been incredibly dangerous long swordsmen, and as well as I stated with their phalanx design system, they would have been perfect for Carthage. In fact, Carthage had actually hired hundreds of Celtic warriors to fight for them in the type of warfare. This also can actually be seen from the uh, Gauls of northern Italy, who were somewhat uh, allied to Rome, but meh. Which the Romans had also used Celts from Gaul as mercenaries also to fight against Carthage during the Punic Wars. However, it's somewhat vice versa, so you see the point. The same can also be seen for the Egyptians, as well as the Persians and the Greeks, who also hired Celts, Iberians, and the Celts of Gauls as a type of cavalry warfare system, which were perfect. In fact, this is actually a less remembered tale of the Celts that fought at the Battle of Gargamela on both sides.
for both the Greeks and the Persians. However, we don't know entirely because it's not exactly explained that much. All we know is the way they fought would have been throwing a form of a javelin in the said exposed ranks. So, that does give a little bit of an exposed system of how the Celts would have been different compared to the rest of the Romans or Greeks. Now, in Egypt, though, they were actually stated during the Bronze Age to be the mercenaries of the Pharaoh, especially underneath Ramses II, or as he's known as Pharaoh in the Bible during the plagues. But you can see the difference. Now, that is actually kind of hilarious, though, because most people don't remember this point in timeline. So that's actually kind of sad, because the Celts of the Bronze Age period were more mercenaries to... Uh, several other cultures than they are today as we know them. And the fact is, even the Celt Iberians were incredibly dangerous, so were the Celts of Gaul. But now, what exactly did the Celtic mercenaries do? What did their militaries do? Well, they were technically used as uh, sheep fodder for the Romans. In other words, they were meant to be used as uh, meat shields for the said Roman army. However, Hannibal used them differently as a type of military system to destroy the Romans and such and such, so it's kind of different. But, uh, yeah, Celtic mercenaries were gruesome in warfare, especially with the Celt Iberians and Celt Gauls combined together, which would be a horrifying scene to think about. Alright, now we've come to Celtic Siege Warfare, or in this case, the Celtic Hill Fort. Now, Siege Warfare is probably one of the most gruesome design systems of the ancient Celts, that of which uh, we today don't really understand, nor do we underestimate. But in fact, the Celtic Warfare for Siege Warfare was a lot different. One was the fact of the Celtic Hill Fort. Now, maybe you might wonder, so, Paul, what exactly is a hill fort? Well, it's this beautiful bastard of a home, and these were incredibly dangerous strongholds that were meant to hold off attacking waves of attackers. In fact, there has even been a Celtic hill fort in Scotland that was belonged to the ancient Picts or Picti, and this would have actually been on the cliffs of a said, uh, well, shoreline. Now, here's the very horrifying part. The ancient Celts would have designed their type of hill fort systems in order to stop a said army from attacking. Now, the only way you're going to end up breaking through the gate, in fact, this is actually what I find hilarious about the Celtic hill fort, their gate system is incredibly diverse. Meaning, just because you break through the first gate doesn't mean you've gotten into the entirety of the said fort. Because you got to go all the way around just to get to the next gate and then all the way around again just to get to the next gate. And all the time, there are javelins being thrown at you, arrows being launched at you, slings, and so on. This is why the Celts were probably the most di uh, dangerous army in history, and this was written by the Roman, uh, who actually later was stated to have besieged a hill fort in uh, the city, or near the city of Paris, modern-day Paris or near the tribe of the Parisians, who of which the island was named after them as a city known as modern-day Paris. But that's a different story from all the time. This tale hill fort was known as the, well, <laughs> the tower, as it was called. Now, the, the reason it was called the tower was because of how big it was. How big was this? It was technically nearly as tall as, uh, a small skyscraper, at least five stories tall. So that's very big, comparing that to how the Romans planned on attacking. And in fact, the Romans knew that they can't use a siege tower, because even if they get a siege tower to attack the said fortification, they got a distill deal with the next fortification, and the next, which, yeah. Now, this supposed tower, as the Romans called it, was supposed to be so big that even a person couldn't even surround the entire city itself without actually taking a major death toll to themselves. In fact, he even states that Julius Caesar himself would probably have never even besieged this city. Otherwise, he would have probably died himself. 
So, what does that explain of how dangerous this city was? Well, it was never exactly besieged by Rome, but actually other Celts. Now, it's actually stated that when the Celts actually besieged the said uh, Great Hill Fort, it was stated to have taken the blunt of the said, well, sword of the Celtic armies, and yet defended it themselves off. In fact, they were technically somewhat allied to Rome, so they can explain a lot. But the hill fort was so big, it was somewhat like a city. In fact, whenever I hear about this, I'm normally thinking of Minas Tirith from the Lord of the Rings novels. So that's actually how big this place might have been in, to the human eyes. So that's kind of horrifying just to think about. But what happened to it, we many historians actually state it might have turned into a hillside or something like that. Or someone might have built over the said walls and fortifications, so that explains a lot. So, how did the Celtic hill fort, and how was it established, is the major t talk of the town, I hear. Well, that's actually kind of easy. One would be a set of layered systems. Now, the way you would actually do this in historical terms, some Celts would have actually found a hillside and just carved out around it in order to create the said, uh, well, type incredible structure. However, there are many other terms that stated that it was built on top with uh, rocks and sand and such. There are many terms for it. So, yeah, it's kind of confusing. However, one major thing that many historians actually believe is that the way the Celtic Hill Fort was established and created is like a rampart system, meaning kind of like a Moat and Bailey style castle, which now you all know how Moat and Baileys are created. One is the fact that a Moat and Bailey, would, which these are Norman style type of castles, these would actually be incredible to the form of defense. In other words, the steep incline would actually break a person's foot even if he tries to climb the said steep hill. And two would be the fact that this would be perfect to see miles all around. Now, one major point in difference of the said Mountain Bailey from the Celtic Hill Fort was the fact that there was actually a moat that would connect to the main gate. So, somewhat, I guess this can easily be explained. And in fact, the Romans would have actually copied off of this somewhat to create another style of famous um, outpost in northern Gaul from the Germanic invasions. However, this would have been established sometime during the uh, second century crisis or after the second century crisis. So, yeah. And even then, this type of hill fort would have actually been somewhat different, in which would have been made out of stone. However, we do actually see... Uh, in a type of video game, for example, of how a hill fort is constructed or what it would have looked like in human eyes. This would be uh, in Assassin's Creed Valhalla, which I find a little surprising. Now, even though this game is very bad, at least they put hill forts and such in this game, or old fortresses, that explain on how the Celtic hill forts would have been established. They would have been established with a ring layer system. In other words, just because you got through the first wall doesn't mean that you're home free. You still got to get through the next wall and the next. And each gate that was around the next one, you still had to break through it. And even it was near impossible. In fact, some of these hill forts were established so incredibly that there was the rampart system and then there was the wall. That of which would have kept out their enemy attackers, but of which would have kept the defenders especially tucked in. This was probably the most horrifying thing that any army could ever face, which could explain on why many forms in history, even early Rome during the time of the Republic, would rather not face this type of military fort. And in fact, uh, during the Battle of Alesia, even Julius Caesar stated he would never attack the said out, uh, type of structure due to the fact it was too well fortified for his army to take. This could explain a lot. Now, the Celts did create their own style of system of warfare in order to defeat their, well, said attackers. So that can explain a lot. Now, though, even if one manages to do this, we can easily see in history books that the Celtic hill fort was incredible to its time. So, why is it that most people don't ever hear about it? Kind of obvious, most people don't know about them. 
In fact, even in Celt Iberia, there was actually a famous hill fort that was established along the sea, as it was put, into which would destroy any attacker from the sea and attack her anywhere from the land. In fact, one Roman legionnaire actually even stated, quote unquote, the only way one is to easily take this city is if one lands from above. So, that can explain a lot. <laughs> but, yes, this ring-layered system was incredibly diverse to its form, and even it was nearly impossible to get through. In fact, some Celtic warriors had even taken uh, thorn bushes, literally, they would have taken old thorn bushes, and actually laid them around the said hill fort, as a type of secondary defense in order to cut through human skin or worse to puncture the feet and such especially if someone was to step on them which yeah this is kind of horrifying so if we can actually put this in history the Romans might have copied this from the Celts in creating their own structure for defense now what can easily be explained this Hadrian's Wall why Hadrian's Wall if we take a look at how Hadrian's Wall was constructed there was the wall, there was this ditch design system, and then there was also the layers of defenses such as thorn bushes and all that, to, and even uh, caltrops. To, as soon as someone steps on it, guess what? It's going to sting like hell. It's going to stop them from charging. This could easily be seen at the Battle of Alesia, for example, and many other Roman siege battles in the Celtic regions, and also throughout the rest of the Roman period. So, yeah, this is kind of the most horrifying part about the Celts, that of which most people have forgotten. But, you gotta understand, y'all, Celtic history and warfare is incredible. And in fact, their arms and armor is also incredible, which I'll leave a link down below if any of y'all want to look at other videos such as Did the Celts Fight Naked? Or as well, if on such, uh, maybe y'all want to see the evolution of Celtic arms and armor. Anyways, guys, like and subscribe, and also... Well, click that bell button for notifications when the next video comes up. Also, check out our Facebook. If y'all have any idea for next year's month of the Celts, please let me know in the comments below, and I'll be happy to do a review for it, so that way we can get ready for the next video. Anyways, guys, have a great day, and see y'all in the next one. Mm -hmm.